our Science and the Sound series. Um, this is the first Maritime Heritage uh, Science and the Sound series that we're actually going to have. Um, my name is Nathan Richards. I'm the program head at the, uh, in the Maritime Heritage program at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Um, before we get started, I'd like a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of announcements. This is, as I said, the first in the um, Maritime, first Maritime presentation that we have for, the, for this series. Um, we, as of next year, we have a collaborative um, series with the Great Valley Atlantic Museum. So we're going to have about nine different presentations spread out over the year on a range of different topics. Um, uh, probably a follow-up with, with this Whalen presentation and a range of other uh, presentations from uh, students and scholars in the state of North Carolina. Uh, the other thing is, if you are interested in this kind of work um, that people are doing and would like to get involved, we have a, an initiative called the Nautical Archaeology Society um, Initiative, where we actually train members of the public to do historical research, or if you're a diver or, or an archaeologist, to be, be involved in projects like this. Um, to, today's talk is going to be about the history and archaeology of, of whaling in North Carolina, and it's a, a, I'm excited about this topic because I'm originally from Australia, and um, in Australia we had in the mid-90s, I was involved as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Um, I was working with a professor, Dr. Mark Staniforth, and another professor, Dr. Susan Lawrence, and they started looking at the archaeology of global whaling, um, looking at the case of Australia. And of course, in Australia, you have this expansive uh, coastline, um, this sort of desolate coastline in many, many cases, and we had uh, Americans, French, uh, all kinds of nationalities whaling that coastline, but because the because the uh, coastline hasn't been developed, we often find the traces of bay waves. Um, we, have, we find their industrial complexes and their tripods and the things like that. And so when I came to the United States, my advisor, Dr. Mark Staniforth, was very interested in uh, me seeing if we could do North Carolina whaling because he'd read some of the history, but of course we have so much development on the coast. And so the, the traces of uh, whalers archeologically is very ephemeral. And so then I met Ryan Bradley, and he started talking whaling language to me. And I knew that we had to, uh, we had to work together, because he was interested and willing to look at the ephemeral nature of North Carolina whaling. So without talking any further, I'd like to introduce, introduce Ryan Bradley. He's at, ECU, um, he's at ECU in the Maritime Studies program, doing his master's degree on, on North Carolina whaling. Thank you, thanks, Ryan. Hello, uh, and welcome. Uh, like Dr. Richards said, my, my focus is on whaling in North Carolina. Uh, as an undergrad, I would travel to the island of Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts, and I got um, very interested in the history of whaling there. So when I came down here to uh, East Carolina University and I talked to Dr. Richards about whaling and told him that I was interested in it, he said, well, that's great, but it's going to have to do with whaling in North Carolina. And when he told me that, I was, yeah, was kind of taken aback because it was just not something that was on my radar. I hadn't heard about it, wasn't familiar with it. And it's true um, with much of the rest of the world, or at least the whaling community, they're, they're just not aware of the history uh, that occurred down here when it came to whaling. Um, I, I was an intern at Mystic Seaport. They were very interested. Um, it's certainly something that needs to be explored more and talked about, and that's what I'm kind of doing in my thesis. The reason why I'm having this talk, this is actually the fourth uh, um, and final talk that I'm having, is that I'm reaching out to the communities of the Outer Banks and hope, you know, hoping potentially if someone has an artifact that they're, they're willing to share, maybe we could take photographs of it, or possibly some kind of um, written documentation, letters, uh, who knows, um, because there's, there is a lot of uh, gaps and holes in the history of whaling in North Carolina. But today we're going we're gonna to start off a little bit about um, why whale? We're going to start off with really the basics. Um, so why whale? We're going to go back a thousand years ago, actually, where, um, it, especially when it comes to Western whaling, or at least the Western wor world, uh, whaling, uh, wh whales were utilized for a number of different things. And the first thing, actually, surprisingly to a lot of people, is that whale was actually on the menu. Uh, it was something that individuals ate a thousand years ago in Europe. Uh, in particularly Roman Catholics who couldn't eat meat on Fridays. They were specifically targeted as a way to um, circumnavigate that uh, issue. They ate whale on Fridays because it was designated as a fish. Whales also, especially when it came to the baleen whales, which is the right whale, the baleen would be used in decorative garments uh, uh, and other kind of ornamental, such as in, in this helmet. The bones, the bones would be used in structural elements such as fences. They could actually be used as doorways and other kind of uh, structural elements in architecture. 
It, the oil that came from the whales, the derivative would be used to uh, tan leather and, and make it more pliable and more plush. And lastly, it was also used in paint. It was a, it was a paint, it was a, a helped with a paint product a, as an adherent. So the first whalers, again, we're talking in the Western world, were the Basque. And the Basque were located, we're looking at um, Spain down here and in um, France, and you got the island of England there. Um, and the Basque were located in this area, and this area was actually the Bay of Biscay. Um, and some historians differ as to how they got into whaling. Some of them actually suggest that um, the whales would foul their nets that they had set up in, in the bay, and so they ended up hunting the whales because of this, and then they, again, marketed the product on land and were able to sell the whale products um, throughout Europe. So uh, they, it, you're gonna, it's a general theme when it comes to whaling, and you'll see it happen again and again. They basically fish out the stock. They get all the whales that come to that area, um, they got really good at what they did. And so the Basques decide to branch out and head to where more whales were located, and specifically Greenland. What they did was a seasonal activity. Um, they would set up, um, and they went to a couple, <laughs> couple other places, but they would go set up on land and set up temporary tri works and other base camp necessities for going after the whales. And then from shore, they would go after the whales and bring them back to the camps. They went so far as to get over to Canada and set up in an area called Red Bay um, in Labrador, where uh, they were successful for a number of years. And we know this um, because some of their tools were found in uh, archaeological uh, dig that occurred un underwater in the bay, uh, Red Bay, um, off Labrador. Um, so tools of the trade, for example, on the left, everyone's probably familiar, this is a harpoon. It's a harpoon from the 14th and 15th century. Um, and on the, on the right here is an example of what is called a drogue. Um, this, is a, this is a device that was used to be attached to the harpoon. When they harpooned the whale and the whale took off, this acted as a, a, a way to slow down the progress of the whale. Um, sort of a bobber, they could follow it and it would also slow it down. Right here is a depiction by a Frenchman of the um, Biscay whalers. You can notice um, the, the depiction of the artistic rendition of the whale looks somewhat like a dog. But the map in the background actually represents areas in um, Labrador, in Canada. So the Red Bay and whaling archaeology, uh, there was a series of wrecks. There was four larger vessels that had wrecked and they were discovered. And when um, Parks Canada was working on it, they did some excavation and removed one of the wrecks to find a fully intact small whale boat. So here's an example of uh, a Biscay um, a Basque whale boat, uh, that which they actually completely disassembled, brought on land, conserved, and then reassembled so that it can be on display. Here's an example of a harpoon that was also recovered. And then here's an example of one of the larger wrecks from the Red Bay collection, which again was completely disassembled, brought on land, treated, and then reassembled. So by the 16th century, right around uh, when the Spanish Armada, Armada occurs, um, that creates some major problems with um, the Basques, who are located right there in Spain. Um, and at this time, the Dutch were ascending in the world when it came, uh, as far as maritime was concerned. Uh, they became a hegemonic power. And they learned a bit of tips from the Basque, but they really um, took it a step further. And what they did was were they were able to process the whale at sea. So instead of relying on a base camp, they, were, they would cut off the blubber and put it into barrels on the ship so that they could continue to stay out to sea and not have to return to land, um, which helped them ascend to the, the top of the whaling world. So by the 17th century, the, the English are interested in, in getting, um, getting a part of the pie, and they send up, uh, some dissidents actually leave England and settle in uh, the colonies that we now know as North America. And one of the things that uh, it's less talked about is that the pilgrims, one of the inducements that encouraged them when they arrived at Plymouth Rock was the fact that the, there were whales playing nearby. There was a number of uh, members on board of the Mayflower that were familiar with whaling um, and basically saw a floating gold mine off the shore. So whaling in the New World, um, as far as an in industry, began uh, really actually in Long Island. Um, in the area of Southampton, uh, there was a community that basically came together and re recognized that whales were washing up on shore. Um, during this time period, again, whale products were valued, they were rare. Um, the oils, uh, the baleen, th these were products that were very marketable and could be used as commodities. And so these, this community in Southampton decided that they needed to be more organized about taking advantage of these whales. So they set up 
a series of wards along the coast. And in each ward, they assigned 11 individuals that were responsible, responsible for processing the whales. So if a whale washes up on your ward, you and your 10 buddies have to go now process it. And then the proceeds were actually distributed among the community. So it was a, it was a really uh, co-op work um, that everyone benefited. Um, and this was the early kind of organized industry when it came to uh, whaling. But it was, it was soon after that it wasn't enough that whales just washed up. Uh, people took the initiative to now go after and hunt these whales. So uh, going from Southampton to places to like Nantucket and on Cape Cod, um, they st started getting lookouts. And lookouts, uh, for example, on Nantucket, lookouts were up in poles that were essentially like the mast of a ship on land. Um, and again, the, the beach would be split up and individuals would stay in a lookout looking out towards, um, the, towards the ocean and looking for whales. And when, a, w when they were sighted, a sound was let out. Uh, individuals would grab the boat, head into the water, and then go after the whale. Uh, Nantucket in particular was extremely successful, but other areas in Cape Cod and throughout New England, it really sprung up. Individuals started to get uh, really involved with whaling because it was so profitable. All right, so now by the 18th century, as we're at the same as with the bass, individuals are now finding it harder and harder for, to find whales. I mean, whales were at first just washing up, then they pursued them, and they pr pursued them so well that now they're just not coming around as regularly. So they ended up going further offshore. And they, they developed these grounds. And they, for example, they named this one the Southern Ground, which is essentially right off the coast here, right off the coast of Hatteras, um, it, it engulfed a larger area. Um, they also got another area called the Western Ground, and then the Charleston Ground. And these, these were, what was nice about these is that they could go whale for a short period of time, six weeks, eight weeks, and then return home. Um, sometimes they would bring into shore and try out some of the oil and then continue to go back out. But again, they had to, they had to go to shore to process the whales. So it was as a result of the Southern Ground in particular that kind of introduced whaling further south to North Carolina. Um, we first see it in 1666, an individual named Peter Carteret, and some of you might recognize the name Carteret because Carteret County is uh, in the southern part of the Outer Banks here. He was the assistant governor, and um, he, he, we have him granting three licenses uh, to New Englanders to come down and whale. And again, they would come down on a seasonal basis and whale off the coast. And then we got, not until 1725, we have Samuel Chadwick, um, who attains a license to whale, uh, gets permission, um, aside from this small document saying that he got permission, we don't have any records of how successful he was. Uh, but we do know that Samuel Chadwick was from a family from New England and um, was associated with whaling where he came from. Um, and then in 1733, Edward Mosley makes this map. And Edward Mosley was the surveyor general of the colony. So basically what he did when he made this map was an opportunity to advertise and encourage individuals to come and settle um, North Carolina to get them to, to you know, uh, use commodities and, and harvest land. And, and one of the ways that they would do this, especially this time period, is, is that you can see there's a whale um, up, up and to the right here. There's, there's actually a, a group of men in a boat pursuing a whale. And then down here, there's another whale. And th these were a great visual indicator for others back in England to say, you know, there's so many whales off the coast, it'd be a good place to go settle. Um, there's opportunity for economic gain. So what the records tell us, and there's not a lot, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing an archaeological study is because sometimes we hope to fill some of those gaps by finding the uh, material culture left over. But we know that prior to the, the American Revolution, um, that there was a few scant sources referring to New Englanders uh, right around Cape Lookout Bight. Um, if you look on the map up here, you got Cape Lookout, and the bite is that kind of little sanctuary center there. They would come in and uh, kind of set up shop there, they would kind of anchor um, in, in, a, you know, in case of bad weather, and then if the weather was good and it was good whaling opportunity, they would go out from there. And then between 1750 and the Civil War, there's again a few references. Um, there was a French traveler who was in the area and he referenced uh, what he called whaling camps or whaling huts. This picture is an example of what mullet fishermen would use on the Outer Banks. Um, they, they also had a temporary uh, industry, and they would go there during a the season and build these temporary huts. So there's this kind of, um, the, the description in which the French traveler referred to the huts is something sim similar to this, something very temporary, and could be built with materials located on the banks. 
Um, records indicate during this time period that there was a porpoise industry. Um, the interesting thing with a porpoise industry, especially in the historical records, is that they were not, in fact, porpoise. There was some confusion because uh, they were, in fact, bottlenose dolphins. And fishermen didn't refer to them as dolphins because there was a fish that is a dolphin. There's a dolphin fish. So they referred to the bottlenose dolphin as porpoise, so as a way of basically differentiating for themselves. There is uh, one record in the 1790 census that occurred on Shackleford Banks. There's a, a gentleman called Mar Marmaduke Royal. And in his estate, um, he included a whale spade, a whale craft, so, um, specific uh, material culture that was related to whaling. And that's it. There's really not a lot of uh, information. So by, the time, by 1875, or right after the Civil War, we start getting a little bit more information, a little bit more of a clearer picture. And in part, and thanks to this gentleman named Elliot Cowes, who was stationed at Fort Macon. Uh, he was, this was actually uh, after the Civil War, but um, Cowles was a naturalist. He, he was an officer in the Army first, but our second, really, naturalist first. Uh, he, he's published uh, works on, um, more on birds and other species, but he couldn't help but notice the whales and actually went over while the whalers were pursuing the whale, and when they brought it in, he took measurements. He, he made, um, he has, uh, correspondence with individuals telling them about whales. Uh, I think he sent some bones up to the Smithsonian. So he, he took an interest, and that's where we start finally getting some documentation about it. And then uh, we get uh, Mr. Kerr, who was a geologist, and he was there for a survey, uh, but he couldn't, again, he was interested in as well. This is a curious event, uh, watching these individuals go from shore to go after this extremely large creature. And again, the area is Cape Lookout, to Fort Macon, um, down in the southern part of the Outer Banks. One of the things that Kerr made a, a, a reference to was actually how much the, these individuals were getting. A whale was worth to them about this time period, about between $1,200 and $1,500 uh, to be split up among the group, which equates to about $25,000 to $30,000 in today's money. So pursuing a whale in a day, it did take up to two weeks to process the whale, but um, this was an opportunity for individuals who generally relied on s sustenance farming and, and fishing for an opportunity for them to make money. And so what they really saw floating off the shore looks more something like this. Um, it, it, that's something that I, I, I try to uh, want to get across is that the difference in which we perceive and look at whales today is much different than what whales were to these individuals years ago. And I think these two pictures kind of help with that. So uh, finally, in uh, 1880, the federal government decides to take stock of the fisheries throughout the United States. They send this one federal official named uh, Earl, Mr. Earl, R.E. Earl, and he came down and did an extensive study. He, he came down and, and took notes and uh, wrote about it extensively in the fisheries involving North Carolina, um, not only whaling, but other aspects. But in whaling in particular, we finally get a very clear um, indication of how these individuals went about their work. And it was something similar to North Carolina, uh, sorry, Nantucket, except they didn't, they didn't create any mass on land. They would have individuals sit on the tallest hill. Often there were the, uh, an older gentleman, someone who you know, could afford to sit on, you know, uh, uh, on a hill or so at times even up in a tree, apparently. Uh, that was w one document I was able to, to find. And they're, so they're looking out, uh, out to the shore. They're looking for um, up to 12 feet in the air, uh, the, the, the blow that comes out of a whale. And when, again, when it was sighted, the individuals were called, the, the call went out, and they would take to their boats and row out to the whale and uh, harpoon it. And I'll, I'm going to get into a little bit more of that later. But again, this is, now we have a very definite, written down um, understanding of what is going on in whaling in North Carolina. The next individual to really contribute an enormous amount is a gentleman called H.H. H. Brimley. Um, he was the first director of the... Uh, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. And he took a very, again, a naturalist. He was very interested in all kinds of creatures. And one of the things he wanted was a, an intact whale skeleton for the museum in Raleigh. So he visited the whalers uh, in 1894 and witnessed uh, a hunt, which he again describes. We have records of that. Um, and was able to basically put a reserve on a whale in which they caught and said, I want you to, to keep all these bones and I'm gonna put this thing back together um, back in Raleigh, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, there's all kinds of problems they had with getting bones on a train and then transporting you know, this kind of decaying carp <laughs> corpse to another location, which was pretty interesting. Uh, but he wrote the most complete account of whaling activities, but again, this is 1894, so we're getting, we're getting down towards you know, the decline of whaling at this point. 
But in some of these pictures here, for example, in 1926, Brimley had kept in correspondence with some of these whalers, and there was one captain in particular um, named Joseph Lewis that he corresponded with, and in fact, asked Lewis if he could buy his whaling implements off him. Um, they had had conversations where basically the whales weren't coming around as much, and in the, the industry had, especially when petroleum was introduced, there was less of a need for whale products. Uh, petroleum could offer the lubrication capabilities and lighting and everything else that um, better than whale oil and less expensive. So Brimley um, got 14 pieces of material culture from um, Joseph Lewis and brought it back to the museum. And what he did is that it was actually a traveling exhibit. This photo is from uh, the North Carolina mammal collection that was on a traveling exhibit in St. Louis. And then the photograph on the right is what was left of the 14 implements uh, about 10 years ago. So over a period of time, some of the implements were loaned to museums, some of them mysteriously disappeared. Um, and I was able to, when, when I finally went there this past spring, I was able to record what they had left, which was only four implements. So this, here, talking about some of the things that they used, the tools of trade, the things they carried, and harpoons. The two, especially in the, the late 19th century, um, the two uh, very important uh, harpoons was basically the double flute, which as you saw earlier with the Basque whalers, the technology hadn't really changed a whole lot. I mean, the, the, the design was still there. Um, the difference was in steel, certainly, or iron, and the, the biggest helpful benefit for this type of iron is that it needed to bend because when it went into a whale, the whale would thrash around and do all this kind of things, and it needed to bend but not break. And, and there's, there's some great examples of, of them that are they're literally twisted in curly cues. Um, there's talks of whalers, if they would test it when you were gonna buy one of these harpoons, they would test it and try to bend it and then try to straighten it back out. And if you were able to do that, then it's actually, it was a pretty good harpoon. But then, um, in the 18, middle 1800s, uh, um, African American up in New Bedford came up with this design and his name is Lewis Temple and it's called the Temple Toggle. And as you can see, when the biggest problem that when, they, when they hunted with whales with the double flute is that uh, there was some, uh, something like one out of seven was successful. That it, it would go into the whale and they would stay attached to the whale um, as far as a harpoon thrown. It, it, was, it would puncture the blubber but then just as easily go out. So they developed the temple toggle and here's an example where it goes in and there's this basically a wooden matchstick that went through. And when it went into the whale and the whale took off, it would toggle like this so that it stayed in the blubber and it, the, it increased the success rate of the harpoons. It went from, like I said, one in seven to something closer to three in seven, which still sounds not very good, but it, when you increased it um, by that amount, it was a pretty good, uh, in, uh, increase. So the temple toggle. So next it is interesting and peculiar to North Carolina. It, there's four different ways to say it. It's a drag, it's a drug, it's a drogue, or it's a drudge. Um, it depends on where you are and who's telling you about it. But again, we talked a little bit about this earlier. This is one example of it. There's a couple different. It, it gets its roots from the sea anchor, which was a way in which ships would throw this overboard as a way to slow their forward progress. Perhaps they're going to get dashed on the rocks, or maybe it, there is a storm. They would use a sea anchor as a way to just kind of slow the ship's um, progress, um, and which ended up being developed to be used with whaling. Um, it goes back, it, the Inuit developed a, something equivalent to the drogue, and they would use a uh, seal skin that was then watertight, and they'd fill it up with air, and then would, they would attach that to the harpoon so you could watch the seal skin um, go off. Here's an example of what is in the Raleigh collection. This is the um, drogue that be belonged to Joseph Lewis, uh, the side view and the front view. And this is interesting because uh, it, it, you can see it's kind of similar to the, uh, the sea anchor, but really this style I've, I've not been able to locate yet. There's still research to be done. It's, uh, it's a unique um, development to North Carolina. Usually it was somewhat of a similar, uh, uh, a flat board, or really a, a lighter um, kind of structure, and this one's just a little bit more unique than what is um, regularly seen. So here's an example of your basic whale boat, your whale craft. Um, you're looking at an individual who's gonna be in the front, who's the harpooner, you got the boat steer located in the back, and then the individuals in the middle are your muscle. And generally around six individuals were in there. 
Now, usually the captain was situated in the back. He was steering, so all the other individuals who are rowing can't see where they're going. They're heading towards the whale. They don't know where they are in uh, accordance to the whale. And the captain was the one who was giving the orders. Now, the harpooner was at, located at the front. When they got close enough, the captain would give the order, and the harpooner would throw the harpoon. And then if it attached, they, again, would throw the, um, the dr drag overboard, and then the captain and the harpooner would switch. And this had to do with a hierarchy where the, the harpooner attached to the whale, but the captain was responsible for killing the whale. Um, we do have a photograph of the last remaining whaleboat from North Carolina. Carolina. This again was Joe Lewis. Um, this, one was, this picture was taken in the 1940s. Um, it, is, it is in the museum's uh, archive. As you can see, there's so, some similarities. Uh, the differences uh, that do occur is that some, sometimes they're built up on the sides more, and sometimes they were longer. Generally, whaleboats are 25 to 27 feet. Um, and the real reason for this is that whaling was only something they did seasonally, so they would need the boat in other instances uh, to be used in the sound and such. Okay, so now we move on to the lance. Um, and this is, this is, now that you've caught the whale, the whale, or now that it's been harpooned, the whale has exhausted itself, and you now are getting closer, you have to do the final thrust and kill this animal, and you have to use a lance. And lance were these very long, long objects that would be sharp on one end, and they had this kind of rounded tip. This is, a, this is an example that I've got um, from one of the museum collections. And the idea was to aim for the lungs, which was located uh, on the top of the, of the beast, and you're going around where the blowhole is. And when it, you, had, you were able to um, kill it, or at least to the point where it was killing, the blood would come into its lungs and actually shoot out of the blowhole, and whalers referred to this as chimneys of fire, which they indicated as basically being um, the end of the animal. Now, whalers in North Carolina were quick to adapt to a technology uh, around that was developed, and one of them was the um, whaling or bomb lance gun. Now, this gun basically looked like a shotgun, and it would shoot an object that looked like that right there on the right, and it had actually rubber feathers on it. And the idea with the bomb lance is that it, now that they got close to the whale, they'd shoot the whale with this, it would go inside, and the tip was filled with black powder. And it was basically, it was also a on, a on a timer. And so they'd shoot the lance into the whale and then kind of back away with the hope that the explosion would go off inside a, a very minor explosion, but then kill the whale as soon as they could. Um, apparently, they weren't very good. That there's instances in which one, I think Brimley tells us that they shot over seven lances into this one whale, and it's still, after it, 17 hours, they're still pursuing it. Um, another good indication that sometimes it didn't work, this lance came out of a whale that was actually killed in the year 2007, and that, that piece uh, dates back to, I think it was like 1882, 1883. So that whale had been swimming around for over 100 years with this lance in them. So next is, uh, now that we've got the creature on shore, it's now dead, you've, you're exhausted from rowing it um, for miles, dragging it back to shore, you've now got to cut it up. Um, these are called spades, and spades were used to, uh, in a couple different manners, and there was a couple different shapes. Um, cer certain ones were used to cut into the blubber, to cut off the large pieces of blubber, um, and then other pieces were used to cut into the bone. The example on the top right, that's uh, a spade that I, was, I found in uh, a museum in Harker's Island, the Waterfowl Museum, that's from a uh, North Carolina whaler. And then that's another one that was found in the Raleigh Museum. But there's uh, references to, during this process, it was important to keep these objects sharp, and there was an individual nearby with a wheel turning to grind these as they dulled during the process. Another, other objects that were used were called a boarding knife, and that's the one on the left here. When you did get a whale um, to bring it back to shore, what they would do is cut a rather large hole in its tail, stick a rope through it, attach the rope to the boat, and then take it back. So you'd use a boarding knife for that. Uh, in the middle top, you have a mincing knife. When you're cutting up the whale, and you now cut it up into strips that are about three foot long by a foot to two feet, you would then use a mincing knife and cut, cut it up I into even smaller pieces. Um, and that's what this gentleman's doing here in this photo. And then the, the last are the leaning knife, where you really are getting at and trying to detach uh, ligaments and other, um, other areas of the whale. So now that you've cut it up, you're gonna try it out. This photograph is from um, when Brimley 
published his information, he had a, had a illustrator who helped illustrate some of the scenes that he depicted. So this is a, a scene that was depicted on Cape Lookout uh, in North Carolina. And what you see is a, is a brick triworks. And in this one, um, there's two up in the picture up there. This one has three. And what's unique about tripods is that they often have a flat side. Uh, so they could be squished together, put right next, up, uh, next to each other. Um, so that's a unique characteristic of tripods. However, that doesn't necessarily mean if it doesn't have a flat side, it's not a tripod. The tri there is a tripod located in, at the Beaufort Maritime Museum th that they know they got from Cape Lookout. And it, it's completely round, um, but it's a rather large pot. There's another example. Um, they would use this uh, fork-like object to lift it, into, um, lift it into the boiling oil. And here's an example of actually an underwater archaeologist finding a tripod. This one's really interesting to me. This, the woman in the picture is an ECU alumni. She's located out in Hawaii now. Um, for those of you who are familiar with any of the stories, there's the story of the Essex, which occurred in the early 19, 19th century. And it's, it's the story that uh, influenced Herman Melville to write Moby Dick. The story goes that the whale, um, there was a pot of whales getting hunted, and the bull was upset with this and actually attacked the, the vessel and sunk it, um, leaving the men to, to fend themselves in these small whale boats in the middle of the Pacific. They eventually did get home. The captain did return, despite being emaciated from not eating. And they gave him another vessel to go out and go hunting again. And that vessel broke up on the Hawaiian Islands. And that tripod um, may very well belong to that vessel, the two brothers. So talking about the whale that they were going after, especially in North Carolina waters, they called it the right whale. And really, they called it the right whale because it was the right whale to hunt. There was advantages to going after this whale. When you killed it, it floated. That wasn't true of all um, species of whale. Some, in fact, once you killed it, it, it sank. And now you're without, um, with all the trouble you went through, you're without the whale. So the right whale floated. It was also uh, heavily um, covered in blubber, which was the source of the oil. And it also had the mouthful of baleen. Now, baleen, these are uh, filter feeders. They, they skim with their mouth open along the surface, and they're eating zooplankton, which are uh, these small microorganisms like shrimp. They look like shrimp. And uh, they use their massive tongue to, to push out the water, and then they consume the organisms that they, they saved within. Well, we valued the baleen as uh, humans in particular women's fashion. Corsets were fashioned with whalebone supports. Um, the baleen, baleen can be steamed and then put in a position so that when it dries out, it retains that position. And it's a, it's a durable material. And uh, um, it, it, it was able to fetch lots of money, especially when it came to fashionable objects like corsets. Uh, it was also used in things like a buggy whip, uh, whips that were used. Again, it, it could be flexible. And it was actually used as struts and supports on buggies, too. So when buggies are on bumpy roads, it, would, it could kind of bounce like a, like a spring. Um, and the oil from the whales helped um, <coughs> lubricate the Industrial Revolution as well. Um, when you had more machinery, uh, the whale oil in particular had a high viscosity, and it could withstand uh, higher temperatures. So now we're going to look at the, the bathymetry of the Atlantic Ocean, because we're trying to understand how, why the whales were here basically offshore in North Carolina. As you can kind of see, there's that continental cliff there, um, and that, that helps influence the Gulf Stream, which is on the next picture. So in the orange or red here is the Gulf Stream, which is this natural current that's occurring um, offshore here. And if you look at the blue, that's, actually, that's the path of migrating right whales. As far as science can gather, there's no uh, right whales are really hard to study. Um, they're kind of elusive. And um, especially in, you know, in, in our day and age, there's not many of them left. Um, but as you, can, as you can see, right where the Gulf Stream and the whales kind of come together is right off here, right off the coast of North Carolina. So really, the whales were on their, a journey headed north uh, with their, it'd be, often they'd come from the mating grounds in the south um, with a calf. They'd be heading north for the, the um, waters of the Arctic, where there was lots of food. Here are, this is uh, highlighting in, on the coast of North Carolina, where we have found historical um, indication that whaling occurred. Uh, the yellow highlights that from basically from Cape Hatteras to the north, down to Beaufort Inlet is where we know whaling uh, occurred in North Carolina. So along with whales, uh, it's also 
to understand that oil from whales was one source, and it wasn't just right whales. There is an indication that there was um, two sperm whales were actually caught off the coast of North Carolina, which is unique because sperm whales uh, are deep divers. They, they stay out in the deep parts of the ocean. Um, so to come in this, this far is rather uncharacteristic of their, um, their type of um, species. And the, the sperm whale was definitely the sought after whale when it came to whales, um, mainly because it had a superior oil than right whales. In the head case, which is the block-like structure of its head, it actually held a reservoir of oil. And this oil was, when you first looked at it, was kind of it, it was clear as gin. And it, as it uh, came in contact with the air, it turned into a milky, cloudy color, uh, giving it its, its name. But also, cr it, cr it was a great superior su substance that could make things like candles. And its oil was used uh, in lubrication and lighting. And what was nice about it is that it burned brighter. It gave a, gave off more light. Um, it, it was it was less smoky too. A lot of the candles, when you think about tallow candles and other candles um, back in the 19th and 18th century, uh, they gave off like a sooty smoke, where the sperm whale oil burned very clear and very bright. So here's an example of a, a sperm whale um, candle. This object right here is uh, called ambergris, and science scientists aren't entirely sure the source of ambergris. Um, they know it comes from sperm whales. They think it has to do something with the digestive tract. And what the, what the theory is, is that the sperm whale in particular um, favors eating the giant squid. And the giant squid has a, a beak very much like a bird. And they think that during the digestive process of this beak, uh, it, it turns into this substance. It's, and it's a waxy substance. But ambergris is valued um, for in perfumes. It's able to be used as a component that, that retains scent. Um, and it, it's valued, uh, it's still extensive today. It's, it's worth more than its weight in gold. Also in the sperm whale, sperm whale oil, which was a superior uh, lubricant as well as lighting. And then w w you can't help but see the porpoise industry, but now we now know it was bottlenose dolphin that they're pursuing here. There's, a, there's an industry or a corporation called Nye Oil that was located in Hatteras. Um, it was based in Connecticut, but they had this porpoise industry and the pursuit of the porpoise was different, or bottlenose dolphin, was different than whalers. Whalers would go out with a harpoon. Um, these gentlemen would use seine nets to kind of corral all of the um, bottlenose dolphins together and basically create a mass stranding. And then they would go around and harvest um, these uh, dolphins. Now, th they had an oil, and I was just talking to a naturalist who's located out of Beaufort um, recently, Keith Rittemaster, and they have a jaw oil. They recognized that there was an oil that was in the jaw and extracted it and found that it was superior in a number of ways, not only for mechanics, but one of the things is that it didn't freeze. Um, he, he performed an experiment where he took sperm whale oil, right whale oil, um, and a couple other sources and dropped the ten temperature in a controlled setting. And um, the last one to freeze, which didn't freeze, was in fact the bottlenose dolphin. Um, and then there's also the Menhaden. And Menhaden was this kind of, uh, basically, they, they weren't, it was a commercially unvaluable fish. It's not something per people pursued to eat. Uh, but they recognized that they could, they could get oil out of it if you caught a, a lot of them in a, in a mass, um, uh, a, a way, of ma a management of getting a lot of them in a net. And they did, and they developed trawling systems and ways to get these uh, fish. And they're still um, sought today. Their, their oil is used in, in industry and other um, uh, marketable good. So North Carolina whaling is interesting in a number of different um, areas. One of the points of interest is that they would name their whales, which is something unique to North Carolina. Well, when they, depending upon when they caught it. For example, uh, they had one whale that was caught in May, and that was when Brimley was down there, and they called it the, the Mayflower whale. Um, these individuals weren't catching a lot of whales, and it was a community event, so there's the sense that, you know, it was uh, a community-based idea, and they shared in it, and they, they would name the whales. Um, but the other thing that we know that they did is they utilized repurposed farming implements, such as a scythe, to use in um, cutting up the whale and processing them. There's certain things that you need in the industry, like a harpoon um, and uh, a, a lance, that you couldn't fashion yourself. But what, what they uh, would do is fashion um, things that, that maybe they weren't able to pick up through, uh, through trading or through a market. Um, they employed the drogue, or the drag, or the drug, 
um, rather regularly. They, one of the things that pelagic whalers or offshore whalers would do is attach the boat directly to the whale. Uh, North Carolina whalers boasted that there wasn't one individual that died during the whaling industry while in North Carolina. And part of that could be the fact that they never attached themselves to the whale. We do know that African Americans um, did ply the waters right alongside with them. There was a group um, that, that had their own boat and had their own um, team and they, and were, they were welcome and they worked together. Um, and also the women participated in, in this and as did the children. Again, it was a real community event. Um, they would work together to process the whale. Um, this, uh, this photograph is one of my favorite photographs that I found in archives. Um, you recognize the gentleman on the right is Teddy Roosevelt. And the guy on the left is a North Carolina whaler named Charlie Willis. And uh, the president uh, came down. Uh, there was, he was friends with a doctor. And the doctor had come down to North Carolina and had gone shark fishing and had gone after these giant manta ray. And he, the doctor got a hold of Teddy. He said, Teddy, you got to come down to North Carolina. Um, he came down in 1917. And they actually pursued these giant manta ray. But the inter interesting thing about this photo is that the captain has in his hand a harpoon. And you can see that it's been bent from its fight with the, the manta ray. But also in the right hand front, that, there's an example of the drogue as well. So they're using the implements that they use for whaling now um, in the pursuit of these other large creatures. So there's questions remains. And like, that's why I said why I'm having these talk. I'm reaching out to the, um, the community, uh, to North Carolina, to try to answer some of the things that we still don't know. Um, we're not really sure where the t whalers got their tools. Um, as far as did they have a regular correspondence with New England, um, regular trade with whalers that were coming down the coast. Um, there is an example of a, a shipwreck that occurred in Cape Lookout Bight that was a whaler. It, that's a little bit disputed, but uh, according to um, uh, oral uh, histories, they, that was a whaler and that they were able to trade or sell some of the implements that were on that wreck to the locals. Um, did a whaling occur elsewhere on the coast of North Carolina? Ta especially talking to a naturalist, we know that whales populated basically the areas all up and down the coast. So in, in, for whatever reason, whaling occurred from Hatteras to Beaufort. W what kind of influences um, made them want to stay there or what helped them uh, find that that was the place that they wanted to pursue whales compared to somewhere else on the coast? Are there any artifacts that remain in North Carolina? I mean, that's really the question that hopefully if I can reach out and get um, in touch with individuals that may have some in their, their family and they're willing to share, we, could, we can learn a lot more about um, where, where, where they were getting them or how they were pursuing the whales. Um, what influenced their tool selection? Uh, you know, especially when they got the whaling gun, when they did, how did they know about it? it you know, it wasn't like, you know, did they read a newspaper article? Was it uh, just how that got introduced, how the kind of cultural um, between whalers outside of uh, North Carolina and whalers here. And then are there any undiscovered documentation? Are there private letters or correspondence that individuals in North Carolina may have in private collections that could, again, enlighten us in some way about um, whaling in North Carolina? So that's, that's it for my talk. Uh, I'm happy to field any questions if anyone has any. sure that the other states didn't, or is that the only state that you have evidence that? I'm sorry, I have, yeah, I have a map. Uh, I have a map that shows shore whaling, and I, I forgot to bring it up. The, the states that are highlighted in dark green are, the, are states that engaged in shore whaling. Mm -hmm. um, so so no, I guess what I'm asking is, are you sure Virginia and South Carolina didn't, or do you just not have evidence that they did? There isn't, there, there's evidence of one case in which the South Carolina um, tried to pursue it, you know, because it, there's, you know, a story or an anecdote where they did see a whale in some, there wasn't an organized industry as well. There's no evidence of organized pursuit. Um, they, at different <coughs> times, they did try. There was a vessel out of Virginia that attempted to join the pelagic whaling, and it was just not something that, um, you know, took. So as far as, as far as an organized industry, it, this far south, North Carolina is the only um, state that historically shows that. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, evidence of Native Americans in North Carolina exploiting whales that might have washed ashore or that they you know, might, might have hunted? Is there anything that you found? I have not been able to find um, entirely too much. It, it, you can't count that out, especially, you know, it, it, 
when it comes to the archaeology of the Outer Banks, there's, there is a limited amount of remains um, as far as something that we could point to whaling. Um, I wouldn't count it out. There was, there's certainly um, in New England, Native Americans, were, that was something that they were familiar with, at least taking advantage of the drift whales that just came ashore. But I've not been able to find anything that said or that you know, could corroborate what, that they did that here. Yeah? Straight down the road here is a section of Nags Head called Whalebone Junction. Yeah. Any indication or evidence that there might have been whaling activity there? So one of the things, one of the things that we find, especially when it comes to whalebone, and there's, there's a couple different areas in the Outer Banks that also have whaling-related names. Um, often these creatures, when they did wash ashore, they would use what was left of the whale, the bones for different things, as place markers, as uh, you know, part of their fence. The story that goes up in Kerala is that it's called, it's called whale head because one individual used the whale head as a gate to enter the town. So you actually go through a whale head to enter into the town according to you know, the oral histories there. Um, but whalebone in particular, I, I, there's, there was no indication that there was an organized uh, hunt for whales up here. Um, but they, certainly whales washed up everywhere on the shore here. So that's what makes it, again, difficult. You know, were people pursuing it, or were they just stranded? Aside from the Gulf Stream going up, is there anything else that you know of that might have brought the whales closer into to, to shore? Well, one of the things I, I'm kind of talking to with um, Keith Riddemaster and brought up the idea is that um, they're going after zooplankton, and zooplankton are going after photoplankton. Um, during t certain times of the year when there, there's an increase in rain, uh, rainwater brings um, phytoplankton out of the rivers that wash into the sound, and the sound becomes a fertile ground for, photo, uh, for zooplankton. Phytoplankton come in and zoo zooplankton are going after that. Well, um, it just so happens that if they're heading north and they see that the right whales kind of sense maybe in the inlets, like Beaufort Inlet, possibility that there's more um, zooplankton in that area, that it, it would be something that would induce them to feed there, bringing them closer to shore. It's not been proven. It's kind of a hypothesis at this time. Um, we do know that there is a confluence of currents that are occurring off Hatteras, and there's an upwelling, and the upwelling brings those nutrients fresh from the deeps, and that's, again, something that right whales are going to feed, feed off of and look for. What is the current situation relative to the number of, in, in this case, right whales uh, off, of, off of our coast? So they, as far as... As far as right whales are known, there's about 300 left. And, in, and these are, this is a specific species that's the North Atlantic right whale. There are other species. There's the Southern um, right whale, and then there's the Pacific right whale. But the North Atlantic right whale, there's somewhere around 300 species that are known. And there's a lot, there, there is attempts to try to understand them. They're difficult to understand. And, and the biggest problem is that they, they are in an area where they call them the urban whale. They're right in the shipping lanes, and they, they, they tend to be using the same highways that humans use. So there is incidence of um, these creatures coming into contact with ships, but not on a scale that is going to doom them. It does happen, but not, um, not something that is, it's alarming, but it, it's not, it doesn't spell the end to them. The difficulty with the right whales is how long it takes them to um, have a young, I can't tell you right now how long it takes to gestate and everything, but it, it is a process that takes a long period of time, um, and these animals need to be uh, in situations where they, they can feed well without being stressed, and the stress comes from these boats. So I, I do know that there are issues, but there are organizations that are attempting to um, combat that. Um, it, there was a period of time during the 60s that they actually thought right whales were gone. They thought they were extinct. And they, there was a group of scientists saw a pod of three or four of them up in uh, the Iceland waters and to, to find out that they were still alive. And since then, they found out that there's at least 300 of them. Other whale populations are struggling. It's certainly um, you know, it, it, the biggest problem that they have. Also, when you, when you have a, a creature that is just skimming along the surface, for uh, organic material, you're going to get inorganic material that gets in mixed in too. There was a stranding recently uh, with two pygmy sperm whales on the coast here, and they had large amounts of plastic in their stomach. 
So these creatures are just, you know, trying to um, consume natural organisms and mistake man-made um, plastic garbage refuse, and, and that, you know, um, the, the female in particular was emaciated, uh, hadn't been eating, um, and the calf was actually somewhat healthy, but the calf went where the mom went, and then they both stranded. Any more? Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone coming.